So today we are having Tom Vip running for Supervisor of Elections of Lake County going to speak to y'all and present his, obviously, opinions and things and his quotes that he has for what he believes the Supervisor of Elections should do for the people of Lake County. If you have any questions or anything that you'd like to ask him, we ask that you write down any questions on these little cards right here and then pass them over to the volunteers to the left and right of you. But for now, the man himself, the legend, Tom Vail. <laughs> overdone, overdone. Just a bit, just a bit. Got to butter it up. Okay, so you know, I guess about half of you know me kind of well and, and half don't, so um, I guess I should start with an introduction. So I moved here to Lake County about five years ago, five and a half years ago. Actually landed on Election Day in 2018. I've been living in Thailand for five years before that. Uh, my wife's business, uh, import-export, we were bringing orchids from Thailand over here. I've been doing that for about 20 years. Uh, let's see, is there anything else that's really relevant there? Well, I guess there is. So, before I came here, I decided that once I landed back in the U.S., that I was going to do something substantial, whatever I could do to help save our country. So this goes back to Obama. I've, I've been watching government. I grew up right outside Washington, D.C. So I've been watching most of my life, but never really doing a lot. But when I saw Obama as president, I said, these people are really serious about destroying our country, and they're making progress. When, when Clinton was president, I saw it happening, but, you know, it seemed like it was a balance. It wasn't really getting that bad. Um, and I, even then, I thought, you know, I, I don't want to live in a country that's run by these people. And then I got to think, well, where else can we go? And, and it's even worse now. If, if you leave this country, where do you go? There, there's no place better. As bad as things might be now, there's no place better. Amen. This is the only hope for the world. So, I don't know if you've heard of the Cloward Piven Plan. Yes. Okay, this goes back into, I think, the 60s. Two college professors named Cloward and Piven. And I think they married at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but they were communists. And they came up with a plan to bring communism into our country. And they've been trying to do this for a hundred years. And they haven't been successful. They always pit the rich people against the poor people because that's the way it works in every other country. It didn't work in this country because, go back to early 1900s with uh, Henry Ford. He was making cars cheap enough that the factory workers could buy the cars they were making. And that's been the history of our country. Workers could do the work and have a good living. One salary could support a family. You could buy a house, you could buy a car, you could put your kids through college. Well, that started changing in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And there's a lot of things that go into that. But what it boils down to is I saw Obama and I said, we got to do something. I couldn't do much at that point. Um, we were back and forth between here and Thailand constantly. I uh, lived in Thailand, then back here lived for a couple of years, then back to Thailand for five years. But when I came here, I said, we're doing something. So a few months after I got here, joined the Republican Party. I, I lived somewhere temporary for a few months until I got a driving license and all that stuff reorganized. You know, when you leave the country, you, you lose your car insurance, and then you can't get it again. You can't get insurance if you don't have insurance. So it was like I was 18 again trying to get my first car insurance. Just it, it's, it's just different. When you're overseas, it, life is different. So I joined the Republican Party just to be a participant. And when, when Trump was running for election again, okay, this is 2019, I said, well, I'll, I'll do the flag waving and sign waving and, you know, I'll... That'll be my job, and I'll give up after that, or whatever. But as that progressed, I saw we need to do more and more. And we, we did, my wife and I, more than 100 events, two to three times a week for 14 months. So I've got five websites, and one of them has a lot of the pictures from the events that we did for the Trump flag waving, if you want to have a look at that, flagsfortrump.com. So while we're doing that, we're joking, we're, we're doing God's work. Okay, it was a joke. We were, we 
real fun about that. But during that 14 months, I'm looking at what's happening in the world, and I'm seeing more and more, we're in a fight of good against evil. We really are. And if you don't look at it that way, it's, it's not just Republicans and Democrats or, or anybody else. It's really good against evil. And I saw this more and more and more while I was doing that. And that, that thought progressed more and more until now. Um, my wife was raised Buddhist in, in Thailand. And she became Christian while she was over there waiting for a visa. And whether you believe in miracles or not, I had left her over there. We, we tried for two years to get her visa and couldn't. We didn't know if it was ever going to come. I came over here alone. She sent the kids a few months later because she got tired of waiting. She wants the kids out of Thailand. Better to be here. And she's over there alone. So she's listening to a Christian podcast and she decides to be Christian. And after waiting probably three years, Embassy called her within an hour. And she had an appointment the next week to get a visa. She was here two weeks later, right before Thanksgiving. And this was right before COVID, when they stopped letting people get out of Thailand. So if you believe in miracles, that might be two or three in a row there. You're not blaming her for bringing it up. Oh, jeez. Don't, don't get into who's to blame there. That's a whole story in itself. So when, when she converted to Christianity, that, uh, how do I say it? it, it reinvigorated my Christianity because I had pretty much ignored going to church for 40 years and it's it's become a big part of my life in the last few years and I hate to bring that up because I, I watch politicians and they say oh I'm a Christian and, and you, you hear them say that but they're not doing it they're not living it and I, I try to avoid saying that as much as possible but as I tell the story it's just a big part of the story now but as far as the position that I'm running for now. 2020 election was a big problem. I think most people know that. You think? <laughs> there are people that don't believe that. Exactly. And and it's it's difficult to bring this up sometimes because a lot of people well, Trump just lost, you know, people don't like it. They don't like how he talks. And whether you like it or not, it's something that we need. And when I saw him criticizing all these people. There's so many people in this country that have looked at our government, our elected officials, and say, these people are doing the wrong thing, and nobody's doing anything about it. I joined the Republican Party, not because it's so great, pretty much the opposite reason. It's not. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be reworked from the bottom up. And we need more grassroots, honest, patriotic citizens to say, look, this has got to stop. We've got to change this. So I joined the party to try to do a little bit of work, try to help things, and after being here for about a year, two years, I can't remember the dates off the top of my head, I got elected to be treasurer for the Republican Party, so I served a two-year term as treasurer. Then I got elected to be the vice chair. There's two vice chairs, actually. I'm first vice chair, and there's another person that's also vice chair. And I substitute as chairman at meetings once in a while. But I've, I've tried to have a leadership role here in a lot of different ways, encouraging people to participate, leading groups doing things, because that's really what it takes. The government belongs to us. Everybody knows the first words of the Constitution. We the people, okay? That's what it boils down to. This country was based on an idea, an experiment that nobody ever tried before. Uh, there's, there's some minor historical precedents for that, Mayflower Compact, Compact and uh, what was the one in England? 1500s, I think it was, or 1600s. Magna Carta. Magna Carta. I don't, I don't refer to that very often, but it's, it was a, a statement against the king, the authority that we the people have a voice in the government, and that one didn't work very well. But the point is that idea has been around for a long time, and it's never been put into practice until this country. We've got a constitution that's lasted over 200 years now. What is this, like 250, if I'm not mistaken? Okay. 248. Yeah, I knew you would have the detail better than me. <laughs> I, t I tend to estimate more. Um, but anyway, the point is, we have something unique here in this country. We're a leader in the world. I lived in Thailand. Well, I did business in Thailand for 20 years. 
In that time, they've had two new constitutions. And they tell me that the average life of a constitution in the world is 17 years. And that's actually what Thailand has had. They've had like a new constitution every 15 to 20 years. Five constitutions since their first one. It's ridiculous. Their constitution, their latest one, is like a thousand pages long. It's a book. You, you can't read it. You can't interpret it. It's not meant to be a, a government of the people, for the people, representing the people. It's meant to protect whatever political, economic class runs the government. People ask me about Thailand, because I, I know things because I was there, and, and they say, what kind of government is? Well, on the surface, it's a constitutional monarchy. So they've got a parliament, they've got a king, and they've got this structure. But the reality is, it's a military dictatorship. And that's what I tell people. It's a military dictatorship masquerading as a constitutional republic, a constitutional monarchy. Because the military decides who's king. The military decides who's in the parliament. The military decides how to run the government. The last coup, I was in Thailand for two coups, actually. <laughs> and the last one, I mean, business as usual just goes on every day. They shut down the airport. Nobody could get in or out of the country. But you could tell it was a military force doing it. They were wearing costumes and masks over their face. So you couldn't identify them. You ever see that happen in this country? <laughs> she wanted to down. But I, I watched that happen. I was there with it. And it, it really didn't disrupt the country, but the elected officials of the party unfavorable to the military, they, got money. they all ended up in jail. No. You know, it was like a five-star hotel for a jail, but they were in jail. They couldn't go anywhere, they couldn't talk to people, and they're prohibited by law from being in politics for five years. They were prohibiting citizens from having meetings of more than three people for two years while this was going on, while they were making a new constitution. So I'm seeing this happen in this country right now. Not quite as bad, but January 6th, to me, looked like a setup. You know, I, I was asked to go there, and I said, well, you know, I got wife and kids. I'm not taking them into D.C. where the Antifa people are going to be I, because we can't protect them. You don't know what's going to happen up there. Glad I wasn't there because I would have probably been on the Capitol steps and been one of the people going inside. <laughs> I've been in the Capitol many times. That those things that belongs to us. It belongs to the people. And and proceedings should be open to the public. They're trying to say that all those people going into the Capitol were were disrupting things. That it was an insurrection. And there was definitely violence there. We're we're hearing parts of the truth. But there's more to that story that they're not shown. And we've seen enough evidence that the police invited them in, the police escorted them through. Some of the people damaging the building, trying to break the glass, there were people stopping them. There, one video I saw, guy breaking the glass, somebody pulled him off, and that guy started hitting him and then blaming him for breaking the glass. This whole thing is very twisted and convoluted. Not, not to get off the track too much. So, back to me again. Why am I qualified? I'm sure you want to know. I've got a website that I've just published, tomvale.bio. It's got a lot of information about my history personally, my family history. So for the last 20 years or so, until 2020, I was working with my wife's family. I was the director of, of the whole operation, the marketing, the administration. Um, not the person at the front of the business, that was my wife's sister. She actually started it. She got me involved in it because we had been in school together in Washington, D.C. in a master's degree program. So our company, we had at our peak in 2009, 2008, 2009, um, 100 people working for us. We had three offices in the U.S., four locations in Thailand. We were selling $100,000 a week. We were shipping two tons of flowers every single day, seven days a week, and no holidays. Yeah, sounds like a lot. But what you don't know is that Colombia is now providing 70% of the flowers in the U.S. They're sending a 747 loaded with flowers, no people, cargo, cargo plane, 100 tons a day on a normal day. Wow. Mother's Day is probably five times that much every day. 
So the flower business is huge. Our business has failed. The COVID shutdown destroyed us. We were in decline for about 10 years. 2009, we had an economic crash, and that combined with some other things has made it difficult for us ever since then. When that happened, I was trying to diversify what we were doing. If you look at my website that I just mentioned, TomVail.bio, we had a long-haul trucking company in the U.S. We had an import business in Thailand that was related to flowers that we were trying to expand. We tried to import food into the U.S. from Central America and South America. Um, we had a construction business at one time. That's not actually on the website. Um, but with our flower business, we, we had a logistics business in Thailand. We had our own office at the airport, so we did all of our booking, all of our handling of our, our product there. Because our, our goal, our, our mission, our principle was customer service. We had the best product and the best customer service. We grew from a start of nothing, basically, in 1999 to $100,000 a week in about eight years. And the reason was customer service and product quality. So we put a tremendous amount of effort into doing that, developing the product. When I started in the business, I knew nothing about import-export, knew nothing about orchids, knew nothing about the, the industry at all. So I was learning from scratch what makes a better product. We did a lot of experimentation. We hired uh, lab workers to actually come into our factory and, and test what we were doing, looking for bacteria. Okay, Bacteria is what kills flowers. They probably don't know that. You put flowers in a vase, they turn brown, the water turns bad, it's because it's bacteria. So there's a lot of ways to prevent that. So we went through a whole cycle of, of testing what would work. People gave us wrong ideas. There was nobody, when I started this in 2001, that knew what to do with the type of flowers that we were handling. Nobody in the world knew. So we developed a process with a company out of um, Holland that does business around the world. It's the top company that sells chemicals for treating flowers. And we did something better than anybody else. We actually had a company in Thailand, a separate division, that was importing their products, trying to get other people, our competitors, to use the same product. And they didn't want to do it because it added a few cents to the cost of their flowers. They cared more about getting the flowers out the door than about what happens to it with the final customer. We were getting eight to fourteen weeks of flower use with our customers when before we started people were telling it never lasts more than a week because of the treatment that we did. It's, it's really amazing. <laughs> I've got some evidence to show if you were interested. But my point in bringing that up is that's my intent as an elected official, customer service. I look at government all the time and you, you go into an office, and, it, and it's not everywhere, but the, the government workers, like, this is our territory, and you're invading. You're, you're, a, you're an imposition onto what we're doing. You need to follow our orders. This is very true in Thailand, but it, it's true here to a certain extent. My opinion is the government belongs to us. Anybody working for us in the government, they're our employees, and that goes for elected officials, too. They're here to serve us, we the people, serve our country, follow the needs of the community, to serve the community. So I bring that mentality to pretty much everything I do, because that's, that's my core belief. Not that I'm complaining greatly about this office, but that's what I'm intending to do. Do that as best as we can, better than what's there if we can. So, education-wise, I've got degrees in accounting, degree in computer science, not computer science, um, information systems. They change the degree names all the time. Master's degree in business and a law degree. So a little bit more education than the average person. With you elections. Want to, you want to take some questions pretty soon? Let's do another minute. Rather Whatever than, you want to do. Yeah, <coughs> let, let's do that, okay? And then we'll have more time for questions and conversation. Great. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> You want to look for that half a sheet? You read these, and I'll find that half Certainly. a sheet of paper I laid down. <clears throat> I have a question that someone gave me, and I set it down. So I'm on the hunt. For so the I, I've got a two-minute speech that I can go through real quick, and, and it's like this. 
That's what we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you running but, for this office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, it's not that doesn't go into that though. Does anyone have any? Very, very much. Before we go forward, does anyone have questions while we're at this intermission of uh, that they've written down? I've got to go look for that. But I, I, I sit and talk to people, and, and they want to go, what about this? What about this? What about this? Where, where do you come from? What are you doing? What are you... And there's so many things that different people want to know. So go ahead. Give me a question. Oh, certainly, sir. So uh, this is a question on there. To my knowledge, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's do that. Yes. All right. There's that. So to my knowledge, the state or local SOE, Alan Hayes, has not adequately evaluated voting machines and the flow of vote count accuracies. Will you hire independent IT and manual <coughs> workflow experts to identify and fix any loopholes and inaccuracies in that process? That question is so broad. Um, there, there's problems with the electoral <coughs> system. And one of the biggest problems, I think, is that there, there's kind of a barrier, a wall, that's blocking citizens from really seeing what's going on. Our elections, how do I, how do I keep this kind of short? Um, the, the elections are run by state law. Okay, everybody knows that. <coughs> Supervisor of elections has to follow state law. But there's, there's things you can do within the state law that would either be better or worse. Like you could do the minimum or you can do the maximum. One of the problems we have is voter registration rolls. State legislature changed the law last year, no went, into effect, went into effect in... Do we, do we have the $100 donation rule in So one of the problems is voter registration rolls. We've had a state law here that made it difficult to remove inactive voters from the registration rolls. There's still problems with it, but they changed it last year to make it easier. Shorter period of time. So in July, it went into effect. <coughs> At the beginning of July, there were 122,000 Republican registered voters in Lake County, active voters. And at the end of July, I think it was 107,000. So they kicked all those people off in one month because of the change in the state law. But what we don't know, or what we, we don't talk about, is inaccurate addresses. So one of the requirements in your address is, if you live in an apartment building, you put your building number and your apartment number. A lot of people aren't doing that. I'm looking at voter registration rolls every day. And there's a lot of missing apartment numbers. How do they get their mail? Or do they actually live there? Because renters tend to move a lot more than people that own houses. There's also some evidence, and when I say evidence, it doesn't mean proof. It means there's something showing there that there's a lot of people registered at campgrounds, at boat slips, or docks, whatever you call them, um, and private mailboxes where we don't know if they're living there or not whether they're a legitimate voter here or not. You've got to really do some investigation to find out if that's legitimate or not. You should, nobody should be registered at a private mailbox. There's no place to live. In a storage <coughs> facility, a lot of them have a resident manager. So there could be a couple people actually living there. Most other commercial addresses, there shouldn't be anybody living there. We've got a big problem in Florida with people that are here part of the year and somewhere else part of the year. Retired people that that <clears throat> never stay anywhere. They're living in an RV. They're here and there all the time. So are they registered here legitimately or are they not? And, and it's an ambiguous question. I had an employee actually when we had our office in Virginia. He had a driving license and voter registration in Florida, but he was never here. Three years he worked for me, he was never in Florida. You want to take another question? <laughs> We've got to get through this. I'm sorry. He's going to go down so many rabbit holes and happens. <laughs> That's what I said. There's just so much to talk about with the election yeah. system. Yeah, just We've got several, so All right, sir. we'll get through them. So the next question is, the conduct of the county elections are governed almost entirely by Florida state statutes. 
Where in these statutes do you find any ambiguity or leeway that would allow for any real meaningful innovation? In other words, is not the supervisor of elections position a primary administrative position? Primarily it's administrative, yes. But there's, there's a couple of things that the administrator could do. One is staffing. First, you get the office staff. There's like 20 people there. I don't know exactly who, but as long as they're doing the, that job right. The second thing is the temporary staffing. And this is a little harder to handle because there's more like 500 people that are running the elections, the poll workers. So you've got to have good training. You've got to have <coughs> a supervisor at each location that's competent to be a supervisor. Plus, you've got to have the workers that are competent to do their jobs. I was poll watcher in... Uh, 2020, and I went to several locations, saw different supervisors and different workers, and it really depends on the supervisor at each location, how it's run. So I saw one supervisor that had everything, to my, in my view, running pretty well, pretty smoothly. I made a couple comments, this is right, this is wrong, and things were adjusted immediately. Another location, it looked like the supervisor wasn't doing the job at all. Was on the phone all day, not watching the other workers, and seeming to me not doing the job of managing that operation there. I saw one poll worker uh, not doing his job, and I reported it to the uh, supervisor, and I said, look, this guy's not doing what he should be doing. Okay, and she moved him to another position that had a lower level of responsibility. Not, not to blame anybody, but it, it's an issue. And being a manager of a company that had 100 employees, we, we hire and firing people all the time. And you've got people that come in and say, I can do this, I can do that, and then they can't. And you don't know that until you put them in the job doing it. But it takes levels of management to keep this working smoothly. Does that help a little bit? Is that? I don't know if you answered the question or not. I'm. I'm oh, we're with, trying to make sure. I'm sorry. We're trying to make sure that you have enough time to accurately and eloquently explain where your position is, sir. Uh, we do have other questions. You, you can read a question in ten seconds, and I can take fifteen minutes. <laughs> and that's the give thing. An answer. That's the thing. We're trying to give everyone a chance to sure. get their questions in, and hopefully. He is answering them as best possible. If you do have any further questions, you can ask him afterwards. We're trying to give everyone ample time. I'm and if the staff eats up your time, complain about it. <laughs> uh, we'll take a Yelp review. Uh, so, uh, the next question is, what is your status on where mail-out ballots, or where, where the mail-in ballots are sent from? The second part of the question is, what is your status on who counts those ballots as well on election day? It is my understanding that both the mail-in and ballot counting is done out of state by a company that was started by Democrats. <laughs> there's a bit of process there. Oh, there's a there's a lot in the mail-in ballots. Okay, so go back 50 years. We didn't have all this mail-in balloting. Okay, we had absentee ballots. You had to have a reason for not being there on election day. Your military, I guess that was a primary reason for doing this. But but even police, you know, if you're a police or a hospital or, or some essential service or you're, you're out of the country or your job makes you on an oil rig, you can't be there on election day, there's a legitimate reason for people to have an a absentee ballot. Everybody has known this for a long time that absentee ballots, mail ballots, are the most susceptible to fraud. When they started doing this in 2020, they knew it then. So how do we do that? How 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 does the fraud come in? There's a lot of ways. People collect ballots that <coughs> belong to them, fill them out, submit them in somebody else's name. Anything could happen there. In this state, we've got a little bit tighter control because you're supposed to request a mail-in ballot before they send it out. But if they got a bad address in the in the voter registrations, and in 2020, uh, 2022, they had about 10% bad addresses. So if it goes out and it doesn't get to who it's supposed to get to, it has to come back to the post office. And what happens there? If you got somebody in the post office that's dishonest, it might get taken out. It's a possibility. My point is we try to 
reduce the loopholes, limit the possibilities for anything to go wrong. It starts with voter registration. Is that enough? Because I can go on. <laughs> He's trying to limit himself. He's being very cautious on it. But it works there. Uh, so we appreciate that answer, sir. Uh, the next question is, during the 2020 election cycle, Al Hayes denied 10 Republican applications to be poll watchers. Is there a legal basis? Is there a legal basis for such denials? And would you implement any such policy? Okay, my understanding, I haven't, I haven't read the law that covers this, but my understanding is the supervisor of elections decides who can be a poll watcher. Poll watchers can be submitted by any party, any candidate, any political committee. My thought is to have as many poll watchers as possible. In this county, we're in pretty good shape. This this is a pretty honest county, I think. We've got good prosecutors, we've got good police, we got mostly good, honest citizens here. Other counties have a bigger problem. But overall, I think more people watching what's going on, citizens watching, is a better idea. I was one of the people that was denied access, and I believe most of those people were the people critical of the election system and the people looking into the process and, and questioning the process. And one of the problems we've had here with, with Alan Hayes is he takes every question like that as a personal affront to him, to his integrity. And it's not. It's looking at the system. The system has problems. Okay, timer says I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next question, and there's more to come. <laughs> and we encourage anybody, if you have any questions, please pass them to the left. He didn't get the answer to the question, oh, though, which is whether he would implement such policy. Oh, so would you answer? Okay. Yes. yes or no. Bottom, <laughs> you know, bottom line, the, the restriction that I would put on poll watchers is somebody that would be disruptive. That, that would be the only thing. As long as you're not disruptive, I don't care if you're the farthest left communist, whatever, if you're there to watch and be honest about it, that's what we're there for. Wonderful. All right, so the next question. The secretive state election supervisor association has pushed a state law to reduce the ability of citizens to question or challenge various election procedures. Do you agree with this law? Well, of course not. Oh, that, was, that, that works. That works. That works. All right, so. Uh, I could go on with that no, one, too. No, that's all right. We got an answer. Well, I thought you told me this was 10 to 1. I thought I could. You know, 10 to 11 for the candidates usually, because other people have a Oh, really? You never stated that. <laughs> well, of course not. We don't think of everything. All right. Uh, so, I think you may have answered this already, but we're just going to re-ask this as it was a question. Uh, what is your current employment, sir? Oh, that's I have not been employed uh, <coughs> since our business crashed in 2020 because of COVID. COVID shutdowns, not because of the disease itself. All right. So, how do you feel about hand? I think you've already established that sort. But how do you feel about hand counting, or what is your opinion on it and its efficiency over machines? Okay. The problem with the machines is not that they're accurate or not accurate. <coughs> We can't look at it. We can't see what's actually happening. Um, it could be anything. The only way to be 100% sure of what's going on is a hand count with citizens counting the ballots. There's a way to do that. It's labor intensive. The biggest problem with this is mindset. Everybody's convinced we've got to have the results of the election before midnight. And we've got machine. We're In this county, we get results out in a couple of hours because the results are there immediately at the close of the election. And it's just a matter of getting everything assimilated and, and tabulated before they can publish it. There's other counties in Florida that should be using the same system that can't produce results in 24 hours. But it boils down to the same thing. You've got to be honest. My idea on hand counting, we've, we've got a model that we've tested. It works. It takes four people. You get two Democrats, two Republicans, two that look at the ballot, two that make the record. It's a very good system. It is time consuming. That's the biggest problem. It's going to require a change in mindset that you've got to participate in this process. We need a lot of volunteers to make that work. And we've got a training and, and accuracy. And there's there's ways to double check this. But it's a it's a good system, but it it's a cost. Clarification. Yes, sir. Is 
hand counting permissible under current state statute? That's debatable. Um, the law says that the ballots have to be counted by the machines. Okay? That's pretty much set in stone. The question is, can we take the ballots the next day and hand count them? That's the question, and I, I would <coughs> say that we have to do that, and I would risk going to jail over that. We don't want to see yeah, that. Yeah, well, there's not putting any jail time on this. Person. Well, but see, this is, this is the problem. Somebody's got to stand up and take the risk to do what's right, and I will do that because I intend to hand count ballots after we run through the machines. I advocate for hand counting, and I sincerely believe that's the only way to be sure of this. I don't think you'll have any trouble getting <laughs> okay, I did an estimate, and this, this is an estimate based on our test. It would take 4,000 people to count all of our ballots in three hours in Lake County. That's a one day voting, one day counting, you have the answer by midnight. So that's 12,000 hours. It's a lot of hours, yes. Would, it be, would they be volunteers or would they be paid? Well, that's that is an issue. It is really it is an issue, and I've got some thoughts on that. That he's not giving me enough time to. I'm, trying, okay. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to rush anything on this. So with these so with these opinions, obviously the previous questions were asking what your setup was that you were saying that you would like to change these things, and on your current on your previous employment and current employment. So. How have you trained and prepared for this job that you intend on taking, sir? Okay. Um, as a manager, which is what I've been mm -hmm. most of my professional career, you've got people under you that do the job, that know how to do the job. So I used to be in construction. I built restaurants. I built houses. I was a supervisor. So I wasn't a plumber, wasn't an electrician, wasn't a concrete man, wasn't a carpenter. Actually, I was a carpenter, but that's beside the the point is, I had subcontractors that built the house. I read the plans, I watch what they're doing, this contractor takes a week to do his job, I'm watching as he progresses, make sure he gets inspections. Okay, that's another thing. We don't have inspections looking at our office, uh, our administration here. Construction, we're inspecting that to death. So we need more of that <coughs> in our government, more inspections, more openness, that's a different point. But, Supervision, hiring the right people to do the right job is what's key. you got to know what needs to be done. This is what I did in the flower business. I didn't know anything at all about flowers, about orchids, about Thailand, about import-export, about logistics. I didn't know all that stuff when I started that business. We learned it. We figured it out. We did it better than other people. I got experts to advise me. I, I hired consultants. On a, on a monthly basis that, that stayed with us for years, watching what we were doing and giving us advice. So if I were in that office as the administrator, as the chief administrator, I'd be doing the same thing. I would be hiring technical experts, cybersecurity experts, computer experts, other people that would look at physical security. There's a lot of different things there to advise me. And I, I think I've got good judgment that I can say, well, that sounds like a good idea, or that idea it would cost us a million dollars to make it effective. It's just it's the cost benefits not there. I was a businessman. I'm very frugal about how to spend money and what the results are. So if we can do something free and make a small improvement, we do that. If it costs ten thousand dollars to make a minor improvement, probably not going to do that. Is that good? Uh, yes, sir. A wonderful answer. Uh, so the final question is, what will you do from day one? to improve the accuracy of the elections in Lake County? Anything that you feel like hasn't been really asked yet, sir? The two things that I, people ask me all the time, what does supervisor of elections do? Two things, voter registration, running the election. There's two things that can be done immediately in both of those categories. One is tighten up on the, on the voter registrations, do some auditing, of the campgrounds, these multiple addresses, or is somebody really there? Compare the addresses <coughs> to the National Change of Address database, to the database they're using to verify addresses. Whenever you order something on Amazon, they check your address. Well, wait a minute, we need we should sure just this. We're not doing that. And it's not just this guy not doing it. We're not doing it in the whole state. 
Nobody's doing it. They're required by law, supervisors of elections that is, to um, do what they call list maintenance, go through the list and see if there's, they're accurate or not. But there's no standard of performance. Okay, When you're in the military, you're supposed to be able to do 10 push-ups and 10 pull-ups in two minutes or something like that. There's no standard for how you accomplish the job of monitoring the database. It's just do something. And what are they doing? They're using a computer program to do a lot of this. That's how they can screen things out real fast. I'm doing that myself at my home because I'm getting the same database. I'm getting the state database and I'm looking through it every month. So I, I know what they're working with or I know part of it that we're not getting the whole database. They've got additional data. When you go to apply for in-state tuition at a university, you got to prove that you're a resident here. Okay, I, I did that 40 years ago. I moved from Virginia to Alabama a year before I went to college there. I got a driving license, I have my person's address, I registered to vote. So I had a legitimate place there. I lived in an apartment once I got there. So you got to do that. I talked to our uh, property appraiser here on the same subject. He said, we have a homestead exemption here. Okay, you get a reduction in your taxes. We check these people out when they apply for this. Do they have property in another state? Are they doing the same thing in the other state? Do they really live here? So there, there's things that can be done with that. So that's voter registration. Let me go to the other one because this will be shorter. The other one is back to the staffing. So office staffing is one part. The temporary staffing is the other part, and that's really the bigger part, the harder part to manage, making sure that people know how to run the election, but it's not just the workers doing this job and that job, it's the supervisors. The supervisors have to be able to look at the other people and watch what they're doing, and that's that's a bit more difficult problem. Right, I okay. Of course. You had a, a meeting at the Villages a few weeks back and you had some poster boards around the perimeter of the room yes. that showed how many people were registered at the same address. Yes. And that, to me, blew me away. Could you highlight that? Okay. Um, in 2020, we had a problem. So that's when a lot of people started looking into this across the country. One person in this county, Chris Jersky, has a lot of experience with big databases, working with government agencies. So he took... Um, and, and I don't think he knew what he was working with at the time because I, I never got a clear answer of where the data came from. But now that I've worked with it myself, I, I believe it's the same data that I'm getting on a monthly basis. It's the state voter re registration rolls. So you can look at that and see when people register to vote and where they're registered to vote. There's, there's a lot of data there. and it, It's so big. There's 15 million records. It's very difficult to go through this and make sense of it. So you've got to cut it into pieces and get it into groups and do kind of a statistical analysis on it all. So from month to month, there's 300,000 changes in that database. It's, it's huge. You, you can't imagine all that going on. But if you break it down county by county or issue by issue, it's a little bit more manageable. So anyway, um, the addresses are another problem. So when you go through a computer, the computer doesn't... Whoa. Ooh, I, hope it was good. Good. <laughs> I hope it was so, the door. Come on in. The, the computer oh, doesn't no, think. It follows, no, simple. No, no, no. it follows simple instructions. So there, you make comparisons. Okay? A lowercase a is not necessarily the same as an uppercase a. If you've got a space in your address, I, I see bit, uh, apartment addresses like 1b, 1 space b, 1 hyphen b. Or it could be unit A, unit B, you know, it, and there's a lot of different ways to write the same thing. So if you do a simple analysis on that, these things don't match. So you've got to go a little bit farther and say, well, are these apartments, are they units, are they buildings? And, and it, it gets a little more complicated and difficult to sort that out. So Chris Jersky, dealing with these big databases in the past, worked out a way to combine different parts of the address to make them more consistent. And I, I've actually done the same thing myself. I did a project uh, for actually for a uh, consulting <coughs> firm that worked with congressional lobbyists where we had a million records in a database and I had to go through and match addresses and business names and all this. So I, I've done it manually myself. It's, it's very tedious. But Chris Jersky figured out a way to do this with the 15 million records 
And what we found, what he found, there's one place in Miami. Miami's got uh, two and a half million people there now in that county. One address, one building had roughly 10,000 voter registrations. It's a warehouse building. Wow. Who's the occupant of that building? None of those voters is actually the supervisors of the election. So why are those people registered there? I don't have an answer to that. I'm just telling you what we found. But in, in doing that, <coughs> it was not one address. There were four or five addresses with suite A, suite B, suite C. So you have to combine those. And, and even in that, there were different ways that it was arranged. So it was 2500 A, 2500 suite A. So all of these things had to be re reconfigured so you could group them together. And I'm, I'm doing this myself on a smaller scale, just precinct by precinct here as I'm going to meet voters. And it, the voter registrations, they're, they're, they need work. They really do. Did I get yeah. your point? Yeah. Did it make sense to everybody else? In uh, the Panhandle, I can't remember which county it is off the top of my head, there's one place with, with 7,000 voter registrations. I think it's, they're saying it's related to military up there. Maybe true, I don't know. I, I don't have the details. But the point is, it needs to be looked at. And, and citizens have to look at it. The supervisors of elections, elected officials, 67 in Florida, belong to an association, a private association called Florida Supervisors of Elections. Part of their legislative agenda for this session was, we don't want citizens looking at the voter registration mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep that private so you can't see what's really going on there. And that's, that's one of the problems with that association. And that's where the harassment thing comes in. They had that harassment issue in the legislation last year and took it out. And we thought it was gone forever because we thought that our legislature understood what a danger that was. It's a very vague statement. Um, it's passed through two committees now. Uh, the last time I checked was a couple days ago. It's got to go through another committee and then go to the floor of both houses to pass. I've been told it will not pass, but you never know until it's done. I've let my elected people know that I'm not happy with them for voting for that. <coughs> How many uh, multiple voters have been registered to our local SOE office? Do you remember? The last time I checked, I it was 38. Did, and, I right uh, the word that I've heard uh, from Alan Hayes, not directly him to me, mm -hmm. was I've, that, I've heard it. That, that they were all legitimate. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. I, I can tell you for a fact, when I lived overseas, I registered... <clears throat> I changed my driving license to a private mailbox so I could have all my stuff forwarded to Thailand when I was living over there. So I was registered to vote at a private mailbox. Nobody told me any different. I didn't know. But if the supervisor of elections had saw that and sent me a letter and said, you can't do this, then I would have changed. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that. That was Virginia 15 or 20 years ago. Nationally, there's a lot of evidence that's come out in trials and uh, with speakers not only here but in other states about all the different loopholes in the voting system that have been discovered, including a, a recent report that really said that Trump did win in 2020, and they pointed out all of the uh, breakdowns in the voting system. Uh, have you seen that Mr. Hayes has addressed any of these? Has everyone heard that? Did everyone hear that question? Okay. So I've got a degree in accounting. I've got a degree in law. Do you think that's important? Okay. I was trained as a CPA. And I, I was going to take the test. And a week before the test, they told me I needed to take one more class. And I couldn't do it. So I never got off. Never did that. But I was trained to be a CPA, trained to be a lawyer. That's important. Not because I'm smarter than anybody, but because both of those professions require looking at evidence to reach a conclusion. Okay, lawyers don't always do that, but that's the training. You look at the evidence, what does it prove? That's what you're supposed to do in a trial. So that's the way I look at things. What does the evidence actually show? So there's lots of evidence for a lot of misbehavior through the elections across the country. Most of that evidence has never made it to trial to be tested. 
I had a rally in, D in uh, Tallahassee, 2021, 2021 or 2022, 2022, where we had some speakers talking about some of the corruption, alleged corruption in <coughs> the transmitting of data from the elections. Okay, it's transmitted electronic data, and there was evidence that showed fraud. The evidence clearly showed fraud, but this is one person telling me this is what the evidence shows. But as a lawyer, you go back and say, well, where did you get that evidence? What did you do with it? How did you analyze it? Can we, can we be certain of the source that you got it from was accurate? So even though the evidence points in one direction, you've got to back up and say, where did that evidence come from and how did you process it to get to this result? Am I going on too long? No, sir. No. <laughs> There's a thing. We're just trying to make sure. Does anyone else have any? Uh, oh, do you feel that accurately? Well, let me know? let me ask Vance. Did I cover that well enough? Uh, you well, asked if Alan Hayes was basically. Doing I've been to a, a bunch of those meetings. I filmed that event that you were talking yes, about. And as a retired information systems auditor, I can say flat out, he's never addressed any of these on a technical, competent basis. And so that's the issue I'm bringing up. Not that I'm biased, but uh, in my opinion, as they say. Uh, and do you think that you're going to be able to fix any of these perceptions or address when people say, this has happened in another county, is it happening here? Will you address it, or are you going to just try and BS people like Alan Hayes does? My opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, I've been to a lot of these let me, meetings. Let me give you one example. My okay. Mm -hmm. So... I have personally researched dead voters to prove that they're registered to vote and they're dead. Mm -hmm. And I have found it. Okay? So, our state law requires the supervisor of elections to look at government data to prove somebody's an invalid voter for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Okay? They've moved or they're dead or they're incarcerated with a felony. If I went to Alan Hayes and said, this person's dead, take him off the rolls, he's not required by law to take him off. And I say Alan Hayes, any supervisor of elections in Florida, it's a state law. Mm -hmm. Me, personally, if I was the supervisor of elections, I would say, thank you for giving me that data, I will look into it. If I find this person is dead or invalid for any other reason, he'll come off. And would you look into it? That's the issue. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's my point, <laughs> yes. As opposed to just... I've had a bunch of people come to me since I've been running for this office, say there's this problem and that problem. And I say, well, I, I know there's problems. I'm going to do whatever I can to fix it if I'm in that office. Okay. Is there any other questions that anyone has not written down that they would like to ask? Well, in that case, I would like to ask one, sir. So this is more of the financials. I know we're kind of going over a little bit on time. But uh, have you looked at the financials of the SOE's office and been able to find any sort of expenditures that are not necessary that you would like to cut down or anything you feel should be funded more? Or have you considered just the financials of the SOE office? Um, I have not looked into that. There's a couple of things that I do know about, though. Um, first, my understanding is when Alan Hayes took this position, the accounting for that office was done by the county board accounting department. He took that division and moved it inside his office. Is that correct, Vance? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Vance has been following these issues constantly. For 12 years. <laughs> we um, thank you for that, Vance. Yeah, it's a great service. There should be more people doing that. Um, the second issue is facilities. Uh, Alan Hayes has been trying to get a larger, more expensive facility for several years, and our county board has resisted that expenditure. Um, my opinion is that Alan Hayes just wants a bigger place that's nicer and better and newer rather than let's be conservative expense-wise for our county citizens, our taxpayers. So I, I would tend to be more conservative fiscally. Uh, appreciate everyone's time. Is there anyone else that has any other questions? There is. Plenty of time to ask any questions personally afterwards if you would like to. Uh, is there any final comments you'd like to say, sir? Please vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not the best one I've ever heard. Yeah. Oh, well. Okay, I have one silly question. Oh. How did you and Vara meet? 
<laughs> How did we meet? Yes. He bought an orchid. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at the label. Well, her, her sister and I went to college together, a master's degree in D.C. And um, her sister got me working to help her. She went back to Thailand and came back here. Got me helping her with her business because she was she was going door to door selling a handful of flowers at a time. Wow. Yeah, it started from nothing. It really did. And uh, after about a year, she got her sister involved. So that's how we've been together for 25 years now. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your time. We appreciate you coming here. We are going to continue this type of format, obviously, with uh, more candidates all together and such. As I said, Alan Hayes was unable to make it here today due to uh, an unfortunate circumstance. But there will be a uh, re-meeting on uh, March 1st. Yeah, I'm not in a hurry to leave if anybody wants to stay and talk with me. Yes. So we encourage you. There are other there are other candidates that will be here for other races throughout the county. We encourage you to check out the Republican Party's uh, websites and such to see that schedule. And we thank you very much for your time. We have plenty of donuts and we have plenty of coffee to finish off. So if you'd like to take your time here, just talk with the candidate on a personal level. We would appreciate it. But for now, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.